Good morning. I'm pleased to be joining you again for the second day of programming for the Center for Middle East Policy's International Conference on the Middle East and the new U.S. administration. For those of you who are just now joining, my name is Suzanne Maloney, and I'm Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this morning's sessions with His Excellency Nasser Barisa, Minister of Foreign Affairs, African Cooperation, and Moroccan expatriates of the Kingdom of Morocco. We are delighted to have His Excellency with us today, especially in light of a historically close U.S. relationship with the Kingdom. In fact, Morocco was the very first country to recognize the independence of the United States, and the relationship has endured and strengthened since that time. Mr. Nasser Barisa was appointed Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2017. Prior to his appointment as Foreign Minister, Mr. Barisa held several diplomatic roles serving in the Moroccan embassies in Brussels and Vienna. He has held key positions within the ministry in various United Nations divisions before being named the Secretary General of the Minister of Foreign Affairs. He then rose to Delegate Minister to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation before assuming his current role. This week's conference marks the end of a successful first year of Brookings and the Center for Middle East Policy's Sources of Middle East Instability Project. At the core of this effort is engagement with key policymakers at home and abroad to ensure that our research remains innovative and critical to the challenges facing the region today. This initiative brings together leaders and experts from the Middle East, the United States, and elsewhere in the world to define the essential questions policymakers must understand to make sound judgments during the new U.S. administration and over the decades to come. Moderating the conversation today is Jeffrey Feldman, who is our John C. Whitehead Visiting Fellow in International Diplomacy here at Brookings. Prior to joining Brookings, Jeff served for nearly six years as the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs at the United Nations in New York, and previously in a long diplomatic career as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Now to leave plenty of time for discussion and audience questions, I'll turn the mic over to Jeff. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, and I, I very much look forward to this conversation with, with Minister Brita, someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a number of years, both in my UN capacity and my, my, my US capacity. Um, and Suzanne, you mentioned the, you mentioned the long history of, of bilateral relations between Morocco and the United States. And the State Department notes that this is the longest uninterrupted bilateral relationship in in U.S. diplomatic diplomatic history, Morocco, of course, is a major um, non-NATO ally since 2004. There's a free trade agreement since 2006. Many official, non-official ties. So I very much look forward to hearing from Minister Burita today. Um, more recently, Morocco has gotten very high marks for how it, for its initial reaction to the coronavirus pandemic that has affected affected every country, and there was very strong civilian um, military cooperation to get out supplies, get out PPE, um, respond to the, to, to the coronavirus. But maybe I'll start off in our conversation, Minister Burita, um, talking about the, the topic of this conversation, which is the Middle East and the new Biden administration. I, and I'd be curious if you could just give us um, a few ideas of what Morocco hopes the Biden administration will concentrate on when it looks at the Middle East and North Africa, when it looks at your region, what, sh what should the priorities of the Biden administration be in your view? And then I'd also like to ask some more specific questions on some regional developments and, and touch on some domestic developments. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm really delighted to uh, see you again and uh, delighted also to participate to this discussion with you uh, and to present Morocco's perspective on the dynamics in, in our region. Uh, I think the Biden administration uh, will interact with a region which has already some uh, uh, challenges and ch some uh, shape shifting dynamics. Uh, during the last two decades, I think 
there are fundamental changes which happened in our region and which are still posing challenges. The first one, in my point of view, is the demographic and generational transition in the Arab world with all the challenges it, uh, it has brought in terms of uh, poly uh, political openness, in terms of economical development, uh, social development, etc. The second is, of course, uh, the uh, um, disputes and open conflicts in different areas of the Arab world, in North Africa, in uh, the uh, Middle East, etc. The third challenge is that uh, uh, the Arab world, I think, is facing today also some economical uh, problems, and uh, which have been exacerbated by the pandemic and which has uh, also deepened the in, in inequalities and the fragilities of the Arab world. Uh, the Arab world is still searching for a new order, new Arab order. The one which has been inherited from the Second World War or even the Arab-Israeli conflict is no more relevant to the new, to the new generations. And we need to uh, rethink the fundamentals of this new Arab order. And uh, I think this new Arab order should be based on common values, common interests, uh, economical one, and, and more inclusive to the new generations and to the new actors. So that's why I think what is, uh, what is expected are two things. In terms of the march, how to ac accompany all these uh, challenges. It's, I, I don't think someone is expecting the administration to come with solutions, but to accompany some uh, best practices and to accompany some dynamics, positive ones, to deal with these challenges. The second is uh, also to uh, build on strong bilateral partnership to show some success stories uh, in, in our region. Uh, the region is also, I think, um, under the influence of external actors, and particularly most of the Arab agenda is today being influenced directly or indirectly by the three non-Arab neighbors of the region, uh, Iran, Turkey, and Israel. And we, 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 the Arab world has to define what kind of relation we should have with the three non-Arab neighbors, it's not necessarily the confrontational one, but we need to have a clear idea on how to deal with uh, these uh, this, uh, actors in the Arab uh, area, but which are not uh, necessarily around the table when it comes to defining the priorities of the Arab world. So uh, the expectations are clear in terms of the march, but also in terms of input to accompany the Arab world to solve its own problems. The solutions will not come from any uh, uh, external actor, including from uh, the US uh, new administration. Minister, Minister thank you. And, and it's, it's really an honor for me to, to see you again and a pleasure. Um, and I should have said to the beginning to those of you who are, who are participating um, in the audience that you can send questions at hashtag um, US Middle East or events at brookings.edu. Uh, Mr. Minister, you, you mentioned the Arab world solving its own, solving its own problems. You mentioned um, the need to address the conflict situations in the in the Arab world, and let me raise let me raise Libya with you because Morocco, you know, under His Majesty's leadership, Morocco has um, contributed to the um, various political processes to try to put put Libya back together again. Um, you've you've recently been hosting. Um, representatives from the House of Representatives, the Parliament, and the High State Council, sort of bringing together the East and the West. And of course, you you hosted the 2015 um, Shkerat discussions that led to the 2015 Shkerat um, peace agreement, the, the the Libyan peace agreement. And so, I'm wondering when you look at when you look at Libya today, we have a um, designated prime minister, a designated executive authority. There are certain deadlines that have to be met. Are there lessons that you draw from that 2015 experience and from the more recent hosting that you've done of Libyan delegations? Are there, are there, how can we nurture the process and make sure that this process um, does succeed in reunifying the institutions and, and lead to elections? What, 
what lessons do you draw that you would share with the Biden administration on what we need to do to um, seize this opportunity in Libya um, to make this work? Thank you. Uh, uh, Libya is uh, very important to us uh, as Morocco because of the geography and uh, because of um, also some historical ties. After the departure of Gaddafi, we, the expectations were very high and for the Libyans first and for the Maghreb uh, second. But today the, the, the situation in Libya is a matter of concern from the security point of view from the humanitarian point, point of view and for uh, its impact on the uh, stability in, in the Maghreb and the Sahel in general. I think from the point of view of Morocco, we have to distinguish two aspects in the Libyan problem. There is a problem of legitimacy and there is a problem of transition. Legitimacy uh, means how to make sure after that there will be one state, one government, one army and one nation. This is, I don't think, uh, it's uh, from the point of view of, of Morocco, it's not for the international community. It's not for the actors, external actors to define who is legitimate or not. This should be settled through a democratic process by the Libyans themselves. And that's why the elections uh, in, for the 24th of December uh, this year are very important to solve the issue of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. For Morocco, the main issue is this one, since, 19, since 2011. Who is the legitimate power in Libya? Uh, and we have, uh, during uh, 10 years now, we, uh, uh, we had a duality of institutions, two governments, two armies, uh, two parliaments, etc. So the issue of legitimacy is for the Libyans to solve it through a democratic process. And no one in Morocco is against the interventions who are saying this Libyan is more legitimate than the other. So this is for the Libyans. Then how to make sure that we arrive to, the, to, the, uh, to, the, to solve the legitimacy problem. Mm -hmm. This is an issue of transition. And what we have been doing since 2015 is how to uh, uh, set up a transitional process which will lead the Libyans to the elections uh, uh, which will define who is uh, the, uh, the legitimate power in Libya. The transition uh, has been difficult because of foreign interventions and because of the lack of trust between the Libyan actors uh, themselves. We tried Skherat. Skherat, I think, was a good uh, reference, but with some shortcomings in terms of deadlines and in terms of monitoring by the international uh, community. We left it to the Libyans and the Libyans uh, 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 were under the pressure and the uh, influence of foreign actors. And today we are still working for this transition. What we have been doing all this time is not to solve the legitimacy problem is to solve the transitional problem. And here we have to be inclusive. And here we have to uh, push Libyans to compromise. Uh, not they, they, will, they, they have to work together whether they, they like or not each other. What Morocco has tried to do is based on four elements. The first one, nothing outside the UN. We have never, uh, we don't have an initiative and we don't have a process. What we have is a support to the UN process and how to accompany the UN process. Since Bernardino Leon to today with Kubic, uh, Morocco has been working with the UN. The second, is, the second element is to work with the institutions uh, decided in Skherat, the National Council, the Parliament, the Presidential Council. And we have tried to push and to work with the UN to get them uh, get into this compromise knowing that what they are doing is just a transition. The solution or the, the legitimacy issue will be solved through the elections. Uh, today, I think if there is a lesson, the first one is a, a close monitoring by the international community. The Libyans should decide, but we should not 
uh, we should protect their decision process. The, the second, we have to go step by step. And this is the way Morocco is dealing with this. Uh, the priority for us today is to make sure that the new government is being uh, accepted by the Chamber of Representatives. Mm -hmm. In the next two days, the, uh, here in Morocco, we will receive the new prime, designated prime minister and the president of the parliament for an informal meeting uh, to discuss and to convince that today it's time for this new government to get uh, into work because the expectations of the Libyans uh, are very high. Uh, we uh, then will accompany each step uh, of this uh, establishment of the new executive organs and to help all uh, the institutions to meet the, um, the date of the 24th of, uh, of December, which is for us the main date to solve the legitimacy issues. So the, the, the main lesson is to accompany the Libyans, to trust the Libyans, and to try to, di to, to make a, di a distinction between transition, which should have everyone on board, including uh, those who, whom we don't like, but, mm -hmm. and the legitimacy uh, 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 issue, which is for the Libyans and exclusively for the Libyans to solve through a democratic process and mainly elections. I remember very well um, how, how Morocco created the atmosphere that led to that 2015 agreement and led to so many hopes. So I very much appreciate your wisdom on the issue of Morocco. But I'm wondering, wondering one more question on Libya before we move on. What recommendations do you have for the Biden administration on how, what the Biden administration should do in concert with Morocco and others to, to, to make sure that the progress towards that December 24th election date is, is met? Uh, I think uh, the, the experience of Morocco during this, uh, since 2015, uh, is that credibility towards the actors and uh, not choosing among the Libyans is a key, uh, is a key element. We have to be pragmatic in the, in the transition and we think the administration should be also very strict on the democratic process, which should lead to the resolving of the issue of legitimacy. But the transition is key, and we think that empowering the new executive organs is very important. Making sure that the preparation of the, um, of the elections is going well and supporting the UN supporting the UN uh, 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 process, the new, the, the, the personal envoy and the uh, structures of the UN who are in, uh, in Libya to uh, accomplish their action. I think we are at a critical moment and the close monitoring is necessary to make sure that every step is uh, uh, being fulfilled and every institution is doing its work up, uh, in the appropriate way to prepare for the elections. So uh, we think that we have a good momentum today in Libya, uh, which we have to invest in and we have to accompany it uh, uh, together. And Morocco, of course, is uh, available to put this experience of uh, uh, six or seven years in interacting with the Libyans, all the Libyans to accompany the efforts of the new administration. Thank you. In your opening, in your opening comments, uh, Mr. Minister, you mentioned the, the three external actors, the, um, um, Israel, Israel, Iran, and Turkey. Um, on Israel specifically, I, I'm, I'm wondering, of course, there's a strong um, sort of person-to-person um, -person ties between, between Morocco and Israel because there's so many Israelis who, who um, trace their, their heritage back to Morocco, something like a quarter of the Israeli population or something has some connection with Morocco. Um, but I'm wondering when in December, when, when you had the conversations with the Trump administration, and of course, as you, as you would expect, we'll get to that. We'll get to the question of the, of the Sahara in a, in a minute. But I'm just curious, given the fact that there are already flights you know, that there are already plenty of, of private trips to, from Israel to Morocco. What's the vision that Morocco has for what normalization looks like? What, what, what do you envision the Israeli-Moroccan official relationship to look like? What would it comp consist of? Uh, 
I think, Jeff, you are right in saying that Morocco is, has a specificity when it comes to its relations with Israel. Uh, first, we recognized Israel when it was a taboo to talk about Israel within the Arab world. And uh, the um, uh, links and the relations between the Jewish, Moroccan Jewish community living in Israel and the uh, Moroccan monarchs is uh, very, very strong. So we have some assets. Uh, at the same time, uh, the role of Morocco in the peace process, uh, the pioneer role since late King Hassan II, uh, has given to Morocco a kind of credibility uh, with the different actors. Uh, for, for Morocco, Israel has never been an enemy because in our culture, in what we have, uh, what, uh, what we have, what we have experienced in in Morocco, uh, there is not such a relation between uh, with the Jewish community as maybe elsewhere. So that's why we, I think, this um, this specificity in, uh, of Morocco is very important, and that's why I, I don't like the word normalization. We, we uh, our relations with Israel uh, were normal, but the diplomatic side of it which ha uh, has to be more visible. But uh, as you said, there were contacts. Uh, 70,000 uh, Israelis uh, were coming to Morocco every year uh, for uh, religious or family uh, events. And uh, 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 cooperation in some field was already existing. What we were discussing is how, as in the past, to use this upgrading of diplomatic relations in favor of the bilateral relations, but also in, in favor of peace in the Middle East, as it was before. There is a potential of bilateral cooperation, which we are using. And so far, I think uh, seven ministers have talked to each other. Uh, interior, uh, education, industry, uh, foreign affairs, tourism, and... Uh, actors, economical, cultural uh, actors are interacting with each other. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the offices, the liaison offices in Rabat and Tel Aviv are today a reality. Uh, they are functioning normally and the official opening maybe will be very soon, but the staff is in Tel Aviv and the staff is in Rabat working as a normal diplomatic uh, mission. What we have to do today is, as I said, how to uh, deepen the bilateral relation, but also how to use these relations uh, to promote peace in the Middle East. That was uh, the uh, intention of Morocco in 94 when we established the relations with Israel. And it's the same uh, ambition today. Uh, Morocco can use all these assets to promote peace, a genuine peace in, in the Middle East. And here again, we, uh, we can uh, work with the current administration on all this because we have many assets. What we are is already an asset. How the Jewish community, the Muslim community is, uh, is living in Morocco under the authority of His Majesty. The, uh, um, uh, the, the track record of Morocco in the peace process sen since the 70s and uh, including in the 90s through the Casablanca uh, conference and of course the credibility of Morocco with the Palestinians and with the Israelis can give Morocco a role to uh, work with the current administration to promote or to relaunch a genuine peace process in that region. Yeah, thanks and of course the, the His Majesty the King chairs the Jerusalem Committee of the OIC which which is another venue for discussing the the um, need for peace in the Middle East. Um, this, Mr. Mr. Nasser, if I may, um, you and I have talked, ever, I think, since we first probably met in 2009 when you were Director General. We've had lots and lots of question, discussions on the Western Sahara, and, I, and, and so you're, you won't be surprised that I need to bring it up, bring it up today, given, given the discussions you had with the previous administration, given, given Donald Trump's, President Trump's December 10th um, uh, uh, um, announcement. And, I'm, and I'm, let me just start with sort of a historical question. You know, you, you have seen um, yourself, I think, 
three different personal envoys to the Secretary General. Um, certainly, the, certainly the government has um, von Wallström, um, Chris Ross, and then a more um, President, former President Kohler, more recently. And there, there have been I don't know something like fifteen face-to-face -face meetings b between Morocco and the Polisario and the presidents of Algeria and. Mauritania. And I'm just wondering, how do you explain the fact that, that all of these efforts, all these years of work, never managed to break the stalemate? You know, what, what was wrong? What happened? Uh, our favorite subject, uh, Jeff. We have spent hours discussing it. But I will, uh, if I may uh, give this image, let's imagine we have a trip. A flight. And let's imagine that we decided who is the pilot of the flight. All of, all of us decided that it will be the UN. The UN's uh, personal envoy or the UN Secretary General who will be the, the unique pilot of this flight. Let's imagine that we discussed and decided who are the passengers in that flight. They were, they were at a certain moment to uh, first class and economy class two were here and two others there. I think we solved this, the four passengers are on board. Let's imagine that we have already maybe agreed to the flight plan, which is the process, uh, discussions, round tables, uh, uh, Manhasset process, etc. And let's imagine that we have enough fuel. Oh. Mr. Minister, we, you are frozen right at a very important moment. I hope if you can still hear us, we will see, wait a few minutes to see if you come back. Jeff, sorry. Uh, when, we, when we talked about the Sahara, there were interferences, I think. Well, we got to the point where you have your four passengers on the plane, um, so... and, <laughs> and you were talking about the fuel. <laughs> Yes, so we have, we have the, 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 the flights, we have the pilots, we have the passengers, we have the fuel, which is the support of the international community to, the, uh, to this process. What we were lacking is a destination. Can, can you imagine a flight with all this without a destination? That's why we were just turning around uh, because we consider that being in the flights, having the pilots, having the fuel, and having even the uh, some elements of the of the flight plan uh, was sufficient. We need we need a sense. We need a direction. We need a destination for this flight. And uh, for years, I think the Security Council has tried to give some indications where this destination could be. And uh, without, without uh, having a destination, the process has been considered as an end in itself. And the process became just uh, uh, sufficient by itself without any, uh, uh, any direction. And many countries uh, have been comfortable in a kind of process-oriented uh, diplomacy. We think that today we should move to a solution-oriented diplomacy for the Sahara issue. And that's why when the United States in 2007 considered that the autonomy is a serious, credible, and realistic uh, solution to this dispute, which was confirmed then by the different administrations, that was a kind of initial indication where we should go, or at least where we should not go uh, with this flight. And today, the, the proclamation, we see it as also an opportunity for the process to uh, ask the pilot, to ask the, uh, the passengers to, uh, to try a direction, to try a destination for this flight. Let's give it a try. Let's see whether a win-win solution, a face-saving solution within uh, the, the, autonomy, uh, the, the autonomy proposal and the Moroccan sovereignty could be uh, uh, an appropriate destination uh, for, this, for this process. If we uh, 
continue in a process-oriented demarche, we will lose years again. And we will uh, still have the humanitarian impact, the instability impact, the lack of integration in the, uh, in the Maghreb. The cost of non-solving this issue is very high. Uh, even for Libya, even for the Sahel, we could have been working uh, closely with our neighbors to solve and to contribute to solving different issues in our region. And we could have been an, uh, a, a, a dynamic actor in the Arab world on many issues. The Maghreb could be the locomotive of the Arab world because we have many assets, but we have to get rid of this issue. And that's why we think we tried a uh, process-oriented approach. Let's try a solution-oriented approach. And the proclamation uh, is an indication. Is, uh, uh, it's not a surprise because since 2007, as I said, the United States, three administrations have been supporting autonomy as serious, credible, and real, uh, realistic option for solving uh, this issue. And today we have to invest uh, in this. Uh, our, I think uh, 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 today the new administration has an opportunity to give an impetus to the process. Morocco doesn't take that, uh, didn't take that proclamation as uh, something which will change its behavior. We are still committed to the political process. We still believe that it is within the UN that we should solve the issue. We still believe for a need of uh, a personal envoy to restart the process. We think the process should be managed differently. We still believe in the ceasefire and we still believe that uh, it's through the political process through the ceasefire, respecting the ceasefire, that we can move for a solution of this long-standing uh, issue. Um, thanks, Mr. Minister. I'm, I'm not sure a couple of the passengers um, are going to get out at the destination that you that that you've identified for that airplane. Um, but I'm 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 wondering. Um, I mean, certainly, I agree wholeheartedly with the idea of with the importance of finding some way for better regional integration. Whether it's for the Arab world or whether it's for Africa, you know, the, the Arab Maghreb Union is the, is the weakest of the sub-regional organizations in Africa um, because you know because of the, the divisions within the, the the Maghreb. But I I worry that the proclamation may have made it harder to reach um, a a destination, make it harder to reach what the Security Council calls for the mutually accepted um, resolution because. It, doesn't it, in fact, encourage the Polisario and Algeria um, to be more rigid? I mean, it seems to me that one of the problems we had during that process-oriented, um, the, pr the process that you described, was the rigidity of, of the parties involved. And I, and I don't see the incentive for the Polisario or for Algeria now to be more flexible. I, I worry that, that they will become more rigid. So I, I'm not sure how the UN is going to deal with this. And when I look at the process over that I'm, that I'm familiar with from both the UN, my UN and my US experience, it seems as though we were often dealing with just crisis management. There's a crisis over Gujarat, there's a crisis over this, there's a crisis over what the Secretary General said. Though I don't feel that we ever really got into a negotiating process. Um, you know why, Jeff? Because I think here again, uh, there is a fundamental difference between two different approaches. There is an approach which is uh, favoring the status quo. We negotiate for 10 years, we keep the issue uh, without solution for 45 years, and some are considering that the status quo is better than any uh, movement. On this, on this issue. And on the other hand, we have another approach, which is the one of His Majesty and of the Kingdom of Morocco, which is to create a dynamic. Autonomy is not as easy as you imagine for Morocco, but if it is the price to pay to move for a solution, Morocco is ready. It's easy, I think we should not think how to make those who want the status quo more comfortable. 
because it's easy for them to say, yes, we are in the plane and the plane will not move. We will not choose any direction. We will keep it like this. I think uh, today it is important to use the momentum to uh, create or to favor this dynamic. Meanwhile, uh, uh, Iran is in our region. Hezbollah is cooperating with Polisario. Instability is in Libya. We have a non-state state actor in our region with arms and uh, cooperating with different other non-state actors. Uh, uh, our security, all, all of us, is being threatened. And uh, the, the, human, the humanitarian situation in the camps is, uh, is very, very difficult. Is it the situation, is it the, uh, the, the status quo we'd like to keep? Or should we tell those who are rigid, and you are right in saying that they have been rigid and they will be more rigid. What is, uh, uh, they what, what, uh, do they have an interest in solving this issue? They don't have an interest in solving this issue. They prefer the status quo because they are uh, still sticking to some already uh, an old dated options and proposals. The UN has been clear. When you, United, the United States, and I think we, it is an important element to recall, and you have been in the administration. United States has been all the time supporting autonomy as a serious, credible, and realistic option for solving this issue. But because the, those or the, the forces of instability, the forces of status quo were prevailing, we were in this stalemate. Today, we have to change the approach and tell those who are rigid, you are not the only ones to pay the price. You are making us pay in a very high price. United States, Europe, Sahel, Maghreb, all of us, we are paying, paying a price because Algeria and 40,000 people in the camps don't want to engage in a genuine uh, political process. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what happens in April with the with the Secretary General's report on this on the situation in the Western Sahara, because the Security Council has, of course, repeatedly called for. I don't have the exact language in front of me, but but a a, a mutually acceptable um, resolution that um, allows for the self determination of the people of the Western Sahara. Um, and I'm wondering, are there incentives that Morocco? Um, is considering that would encourage the Polisario um, and Algeria to look more favorably upon you know, the, the autonomy plan than has happened so far. I mean, the, as I understand, the Polisario has been willing to discuss the autonomy plan if Morocco also discusses the Polisario's plan, and it, and it, it leads to a very sterile discussion um, in the past. But are there things that Morocco can do differently now that would encourage um, more flexibility on the part of Algeria and the Polisario? I think during the last uh, four or five years, there have been many fundamental uh, changes in the, on this issue. First of all, I think Morocco rejoined the African Union and uh, uh, this organization is no more being used for a specific agenda. Second, 20 and maybe in the next two days, 22 or 23 countries have opened their consulates in Dakhla and Layoun, showing their support to Morocco. Three, we organized end of January, quickly a conference on, in support of autonomy. Almost 50 countries participated in that conference from different regions of the world showing that autonomy is the option which is preferred by the international community to solve uh, this issue. So there, there is today a reality, which is that autonomy is gaining space and autonomy option is being supported by, largely by the international community. Uh, it is supported not only by the United States, it's supported by other permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, which are in the same path. Uh, Morocco is ready to discuss uh, seriously 
the autonomy plan and to show all the incentives that this plan is offering to the other parties. Morocco is not willing to win. Morocco is willing to solve an issue. Morocco is not willing to uh, a solution where there is a winner and a loser. Morocco is working for a win-win solution. And we think the autonomy is the compromised uh, solution. And we think that if we give a chance to this destination, uh, the passengers will see already from the window that it is a really attractive one. And then when the, the plane will land, uh, the, we, will, we will find something which, is, uh, which will uh, have everyone comfortable with it. We think that the autonomy plan is a, frame, a framework and its details, its content is a matter of negotiation. And the other parties should engage in that negotiation and nourish this plan with their ideas and with their proposals. Uh, it's not a take it or leave it proposal. It's a broad framework which is open to a discussion and negotiation. And this is, we think, what the process uh, should, be, should be about. Otherwise, the plane will continue to, uh, uh, to not to move. And maybe one day we will lose the fuel which we have today from the international community. But already, already the region, the people are paying a high price uh, uh, by favoring this status quo strategy. Uh, we, we have to ask the other, uh, Algeria and Polisario, uh, what, uh, who is paying for this, for, this, uh, for this drama? It's the region, it's the people, and it's the Maghreb. It's easy for someone, I'm sorry, in, uh, in Oklahoma or in another, to say, no, no, I want this solution, th this issue to be solved this way. But he is not living in the camp. He is not living 45 years in, in, in a very bad situation. He is not being attracted today and tomorrow even more by terrorist groups and by transnational crime. Uh, the situation, uh, uh, we think that it is time to make a choice. Do we want the status quo to prevail? And then we can continue in a UN or in a, a process driven approach. Do we want a solution? And we have, we have tried other, other, uh, other possibilities and we failed. Today we have an opportunity with this proclamation and with this new administration to have a different process. And Morocco is committed to this process. Morocco is committed to the UN process, but we don't lose, want to lose this fuel. We don't want to lose time to lose the international community's support in something which is a kind of rhetoric for 15 rounds, as you said, the same language. Today, we have to give a direction to the pilots and the pilots will try and the passengers will be happy at the end, for sure. Th thanks, thanks, Nasser. Thanks, Mr. Minister. Um, I suspect we'll have more opportunities to, dis to discuss this because um, despite all that you've laid out, I think that there still is a, a problem. The, 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 there's not yet a solution, even if there is a proclamation from President Trump and the conferences you've said, but we're, we're since time is short, I also want to, even though you're foreign minister, I want to take advantage of, of, of your presence to just touch on, on Morocco's domestic uh, situation because you know, His Majesty the King has been on the throne now for um, nearly 20, 22 years. And there's been considerable progress in terms of civil rights, rule of law, um, um, judicial due process, which both Morocco, Moroccans themselves, as well as Morocco, Morocco's friends abroad have, have knowledge and appreciated. You know, I, I, the status of women in Morocco under his majesty the king has been, has been much improved. But, but more recently, there have been some concerns expressed about a more heavy handed approach to some of the civil liberties. And, and this kind of hits, this hits home at Brookings, because um, one of the one of the persons caught up in what seems what seems to be a more heavy-handed approach to civil liberties is a former fellow at Brookings. Um, now, obviously, we have our own civil liberties issues in the United States, as we saw on January sixth. But these issues, human rights, civil liberties, are of course of concern to the Biden administration. And I was wondering um, how you plan to discuss these issues when you have a, when you have a chance to meet your your counterpart, Secretary Blinken. Uh, as you said, Jeff, I think Morocco and His Majesty 
uh, have been pioneers in, uh, in this. Uh, when I was DG 15 years ago, we started a human rights dialogue with the United States. And Morocco is the only country discussing with the United States uh, uh, the, uh, the, during the process of uh, elaboration of the human rights reports of the State Department. And we accepted this. We think that human rights uh, dialogue is an, an asset for our partnership. Morocco-US partnership is also a partnership of values. And uh, Morocco has uh, discussing human rights is not uh, taboo for Morocco. We are open and we have been all the time discuss, discussing them because it's an opportunity to show what Morocco is doing, what His Majesty has been doing during the, the last 20 years. You talked about the first generation of human rights, political rights of women, the constitution of 2011. Uh, we, uh, we are progressing also on the economical and social rights. And uh, His Majesty announced uh, three months ago a large program of social, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, social protection uh, for all the Moroccans, uh, which is the healthcare, which is the uh, uh, indemnities for the jobless, etc. So we are engaging in uh, and enlarging the scope of the uh, progress in human rights. Uh, so I, uh, Morocco has also an aspect which is, I, uh, I think, not yet uh, or not all the time taken into account, which is the community rights. What is this Arab country where a Jewish community is still living with its uh, uh, personal status rights, with its tribunals, with its synagogues, and uh, they are living in, 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 in peace and side by side by the Muslim, the Muslim community. Uh, migrants, we have, Morocco is becoming a country of destination. You have thousands of migrants who are today being vaccinated uh, in Morocco with the same rights like the Moroccan citizens. So uh, Morocco is progressing on different uh, aspects of the human rights under the leadership of His Majesty. Uh, Morocco is not a paradise for human rights. We have challenges like all other countries, but we are clear in, in what is the ambition and we are clear that we have a big asset, which is the leadership and the conviction of His Majesty. And that's why we are, we are making this progress. Could we talk about uh, what you call a step back or step backward? Uh, uh, I, I don't think it is fair uh, to, to, to mention it when it comes to Morocco. And the, the, the record of Morocco when it comes to human rights is clear. And that's why with the new administration, we are comfortable in discussing uh, human rights because we think it's an asset for the relation. I, 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 uh, as a matter of principle, I don't discuss ongoing cases because uh, they are uh, in the hands of the justice. I trust the justice of Morocco because I think it's a guarantee for this uh, for these people you are mentioning, not uh, not a risk, because uh, what is important is to have a fair and due process, and this I can tell you, Jeff that it will be granted a fair and due process. And if, uh, if someone is going to, uh, to a tribunal, it's not a risk, it's a chance to defend himself and to show that uh, something is unfair. But we cannot prejudge because there is a situation, because the, the, the justice is taking in charge one issue that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a step backwards or I don't think so. I think that Morocco is Morocco you have known with His Majesty, with a clear vision. And we think that stability in Morocco is also linked to reforms in Morocco. And this is what His Majesty has been doing for years, keeping stability th through continuous economical, political, and social reforms. And this is uh, what, what His Majesty will continue to do. Mr. Minister, um, I want to, on, on behalf of Brookings, 
and also just personally to say thank you to you for spending time with us today, for sharing your views on the region and on Morocco um, with, with the Brookings audience today. And I, I very much look forward to seeing you in person, um, not only virtually, the next time you're able to come to Washington or I'm able to go to Morocco. Um, and so thank you very, very much for, thank you, for, for your words today, thank Nas, you very much. and my thank very, you, very much to you. And for, for those of you that are, are watching, um, please stay on. The, the next session will start soon. A European perspective on the Biden administration, at least. Nasser, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.